Champions, how are we? We're doing a bit of a different video today, <clears throat> aside from the usual electronic stuff. We're going to set up a guitar, do a, what I call a clean setup and service. So uh, this guitar is an affordable guitar, it's a Yamaha Pacifica. And the owner brought it in and I gave them a quote and they said that seems expensive and I said compared to what and they said well it just seems expensive and I said what have you got a quote from somewhere else and I'm more expensive than it or something and they're like no I've never had a guitar set up before I said okay so what what are you comparing it with um, they said then uh, that Oh, you're just giving it a wipe down and slapping a new set of strings on it, are you? That should only be about 20 bucks. And my setup, uh, clean and service, is 75 plus GST, and then that's not including strings. So I then spent 20 minutes explaining to them what's involved in making this guitar actually perform so you want to pick it up instead of dreading picking it up. Now, I believe she's trying to get a son into playing guitar. If you have a guitar that's playing like crap, the kid's gonna think it's their fault and they're gonna not be inspired. They're gonna think the problem lies with them. Uh, they're gonna not wanna play. They're gonna not wanna go to lessons. They're not gonna see results and they'll eventually give it away and they won't follow through with it. I've seen this happen all the time. Um, so this is the video to basically show what's involved in a detailed setup and service. I mean, I can just put strings on it and if your budget's limited, tune it up, just have a look at it, at least tell you what's wrong with it. And it's cheaper, but it's gonna come back playing pretty much the same as it was before, just your strings aren't rusty. So after having a chat with them, they decided to go ahead just to see how good this thing can be. And the Pacific is a great value for what they are. The timber's good, nice straight grain timber in the neck. The necks tend to stay pretty straight over the years. Some of the uh, the Indonesian guitars or the lower lower ticket ones these days, uh, the timber is pretty curly. You can see knots and stuff all through the neck. Curly grain usually means if it's not fully seasoned, that it's going to twist and move as it seasons further. Uh, so having straight grain is a win, particularly on a low end guitar. And the Pacific is there, you know, they're around the two three hundred dollar range. Um, and for that, they're kind of unbeatable. They've got the strat look, same old thing as everyone else. The corners are slightly squarer, so a little bit less comfortable to play than a, than a squire or whatever. Uh, but, you know, they do the job, and for a, for a person starting out, they're, they're more than ample providing their setup. I'd rather buy a cheap guitar and get it set up, set aside that little bit of money in the budget, instead of going and getting the most expensive guitar you can possibly afford and then just playing it out of the box because they all say, oh, it's set up from the factory. They're not, they never are. They've moved in transit. They've undergone dramatic temperature and humidity shifts in shipping. Everything needs to be set up here. Plus, it's like, it's like getting a new suit. You buy the suit and then you have to get it tailored. Uh, you can wear the suit if you want, but you're going to look like a bit of a clown, just like if you're playing guitar straight out of the box. Some are closer than others, but generally I've found none of them, none of them can't be improved significantly by a setup and service, and that's not, not me trying to spruik my wares. I'm busy enough how it is. But it's worth doing, and at least then you know what the instrument's capable of and what you do forwards. You can shift it one way or the other according to how you're playing develops over the years, what styles you morph into, but at least you know you're starting from a base point of, you know, a pretty standard setup, and you know that if there's any major problems with playing it, chances are it's you, not the guitar. <laughs> Just run over this thing from the body up. This is totally par for the course on how instruments come in. They're usually missing one or two knobs or a switch tip or got a few reamed out screws from people trying to fix their own stuff. Uh, the bridge is usually pretty dusty and slightly corroded, as you can see there. It's not too bad. I've seen much, much worse than that. Pick guard's usually pretty dusty. The strings are rusty. Uh, the fretboard is usually dirty, and, and, and the frets have got a bit of 
just a bit of a patina, like a bit of a haze on them or a, or a significant corrosion. And uh, almost always if there are nuts fixing those posts, they're almost always loose. Uh, another thing on some models, not this one in particular, but on some models, um, the little nylon washers under the buttons there crush and fall out and uh, need replacing, that's fine. I've got them in stock. So the, the fretboard timber is usually pretty dry, never seen oil or cleaning in its life. Um, no maintenance at all to the timber. Uh, so yeah, that's that's totally how it comes in. It's got one broken string and um, they're pretty rusty. So on the back there, yeah, it's pretty good nick. You know, not many, not many uh, scratches or anything. It almost looks like a showroom. You know, just a demo model guitar. It's been sitting on a stand, you can see. There's a bit of um, just just grunge on the on the vertical surfaces there from just dust that's been sitting there and absorbed moisture. Uh, but generally, it's pretty unadulted. This one, no one's really messed with it or reamed screws out or stripped anything or tried to fix stuff. So it should be pretty straightforward. So start by removing the strings. Got some. Uh, hardened steel cutters here. If you use standard cutters from the hardware, every time you cut a string it just leaves a little hole in the blades. You need like tempered steel. They call it piano wire cutters. You look on eBay or whatever. <clears throat> Any decent electrical cutters, 160 mil handle will uh, fit the bill. Just remove them from the Tuning posts, set them aside. Now, sometimes when the bridge lets go, the holes in the bridge block, which I'll show you in a minute, this is a tremolo model, the holes in the bridge block will move and go out of the range of these holes here so you won't be able to get the strings out. So I'll just remove this. The springs and the wire connected to it uh, for grounding. I like to inspect them anyway just to check everything's cool. Check that there's no foam in there on the on the spring seat. This here will assess whether or not it might be a better idea to back that off a bit and put another spring in there. It's only got two springs, I'm not sure that's factory. <clears throat> I didn't check the gauge of these strings um, but after discussing the purpose and the scale length with the customer, we've decided to go with Elixir 9242s in standard tuning. Now, I sell Elixir, uh, they're about double the cost of an uncoated string like an Ernie Ball retail. I'm not trying to upsell them, but I explained to the customer that. If this guitar is not getting played every day, you might want to consider a coated string because uh, your skin acids will build up on those strings and slowly attack them and, and rust them as well as the ambient humidity. Those have a coating on them to prevent that so they last and stay fresh for longer. Now if you're playing the thing every day, the, just the action of playing it generally wears the corrosion back off them and they'll probably snap before they get a chance to corrode anyway if you're playing it every day just by you know the coat hanger effect you bend it back and forwards enough times and uh, it snaps but the coated string will look and sound fresh until the day it breaks generally they do get a little bit furry around where you pick but uh, I found that doesn't really affect the tone some people find them too bright but there are different um, coating thicknesses available to to tamp that down a bit too Anyway, we'll just give it a quick preliminary dusting. A little bit of a scratch there. And just with a damp rag, you can use a, a, a little bit if it's really grungy like smokers who have uh, all the congealed tobacco on their fingers ends up crusting up the fretboard or just people that don't wash their hands before you play. You should wash your hands before you play. Um, you might have a fair bit of dirt to remove on the fretboard but generally a just slightly damp rag is, is enough. 
Bear in mind that the uh, the timber on this one's probably pretty dehydrated from never being treated, so a tiny bit of moisture on the face probably isn't the worst thing for it. In the process, that's that's actually taking a bit of dust off the frets too and shine them up a little bit as well, which we can develop on. So, got the majority of the schmoo off the fretboard. Then I'll use a touch of metal polish. Sorry to deafen you there. <laughs> Just a touch of metal polish, which is Mother's Mag and Aluminium Polish. I use it a little bit on the lid. Just get the tiniest little bit just like barely any on a rag stretched over my finger. Then I use a fret guard. So these are available from you know Luthiers and or even just um, eBay. And just uh, give each fret a little bit of a polish. That combined with the coated strings makes it look really fresh when you give it back to them. Something they're proud to play. It also does to a degree when you bend the note, it makes it less coefficient of friction. The string glides a bit easier. I was starting to lose the effectiveness. You can see the metal is actually it's actually coming off. That's the black. That's that's literally microscopic particles of um, the fret wire essentially. It is slightly, slightly abrasive. That's what all polishes are. Now these uh, these fret guards, obviously, when you you get higher up the fretboard, particularly on models with 24 frets or more, uh, you need to go down to the next size because it starts to not fit between the frets. If you don't have one of them, you can just mask the fretboard or just. Um, be really gentle and mask each fret at once or something like that. There's a few ways around it if you don't want to spend the money or if you just don't want to have extra bits and pieces lying around that you're probably only going to use once a year. If that. Generally, once a guitar is set up, unless you change the string gauge, the tuning, uh, or you know, set it up for slide or something, you you generally can sort of set and forget it for at least the season you're in. Uh, if you set it up in the middle of winter, you're going to need to probably set it up again in the middle of summer. Or I like to set them up in the changing seasons just to get ready for the next one and uh, sort of maintain an average around spring and autumn. But we're pretty uh, we're pretty stable temperature-wise around around here, Western Sydney. It does get very hot, but it doesn't get that cold. But yeah, just treating guitars like they're children or dogs. Flog them when you feel like it and uh, don't leave them in hot cars. <laughs> so this, we did our best to protect the fretboard, but of course a little bit of polish will get down under that guard. So to get that off, use a bit of shellite, otherwise known as naphtha in the US. I think we, we call it shellite over here. It's used in Zippos, that kind of thing. Just get a semi-clean rag. Touch of that. Obviously don't smoke while you're doing it. <laughs> it is flammable. <clears throat> Just get your thumbnail down between the fret and the fretboard. And just get any residual polish out. Now naps is pretty uh, pretty benign, it won't attack finishes, even nitro, nitrocellulose I mean, with poly it won't have a chance of attacking it, which all, all the Asian guitars generally are polyurethane or older ones polyester finish. It's actually real mother of pearl on this one. 
not that plastic stuff. It's got the multicolored iridescence that you only get from actual mother of pearl or abalone. Not the, the pearloid stuff, which is just metallic particles in translucent plastic, essentially. Give the <coughs> tuning buttons a bit of a clean as well over there. They're coming up all right. Now, a bit of fretboard oil. So this stuff here, I've decanted it into a little bottle, but this is one of the decent ones. Uh, that's available in Australia from Bunnings. Slightly thicker than your average uh, fretboard oil. The ones that <clears throat> you get from you know Dunlop and stuff. I found they're a bit thin and smell a bit solventy. Uh, if if uh, if it's got like thinners and stuff in it, you're probably going to take moisture out of the wood more than lock it in, and it evaporates. Whereas this stuff tends not to. It sort of soaks in and then just stays there, but it doesn't gather dust and doesn't go sticky over time. I've used it for years. <clears throat> and you can use it on chopping boards, kids' toys, that kind of thing. It's uh, non-toxic, obviously, because your, your hands are all over the fretboard, so that's a good, good thing. Generally, I'll let that sit. If the guitar's never seen an oil before, I'll let that sit for a good 20 minutes and uh, come back and wipe off the excess. All right, so we've wiped off the excess oil. Just give you a look at the fret. See, look at that. Look how shiny there. Looks very much nicer, doesn't it? Something you want to pick up and play when you walk past it, not dread picking up. <laughs> So I've got the damp rag again, and we'll just um, give the plastics a little bit of a once over. Don't get too much water in this area, just literally just damp to the touch. Squeeze all the excess moisture out of it, and that's all you want because you don't want moisture getting down between the, <clears throat> the pole pieces, you might kill the pickup. Not on these ones because they're cheapo pickups that have plastic bobbins, but on Traditional style pickups, that's an issue. A little bit of plastic on the uh, pick guard left over there, that's pretty well customary. <laughs> so I've just plugged it in to check the uh, functionality and see if the electronics are scratchy or anything, and uh, pretty standard. Pots, uh, the jack's loose. Got a plastic jack plate which isn't great, but it's not broken yet. Uh, but we might whack that cover off and just see if they've done what all the manufacturers seem to do and not use the lock washer or star washer. Piss off fly. Yeah, no, no star washer there. So all the manufacturers seem to insist on just using another nut, thinking that's going to tighten it. It never does. So we'll whack that off. Get rid of that. And we'll put a star washer on there. Right, so we'll put one of those little buggers on there. Back on with the plate. Forget about the uh, the internal nut. And just use the uh, dress nut. Pokes out a little bit too much. We might put that nut back on and put the lock washer over that. Solder joints are okay, I just had a quick look while I was there. It's not the best quality jack, but you know, it does the job. <clears throat> just get a tube socket. It'll be a 12 mil that one. Being uh, Chinese, probably metric. I don't even know where you get metric sockets from. <laughs> eBay, I guess. A 
I uh, use Switchcraft 11s, which are 3 eighths, whatever that is, 9.56 or something millimetres. So, there we go. A lot more sturdy. Right, so I've just given the electronics a quick test. Uh, I should have done this before I took the strings off. That would be the smart thing to do, but who said I'm smart? So here we, we can hear the noise coming from the uh, amplifier, which has got the gain turned up pretty high. No real scratchiness there. Tone control's working. Switch is working. Just grab a non-magnetised, non-magnetised, that's important. Otherwise you might stuff a pickup. These are ceramic anyway, but the Alnico pickups, you might demagnetise them. And you can give it a little tap test with a very fine screwdriver, just gently. Yep, so both of them are working. Next position. Yep. It's picking up just the ambience because the gain set so high, but... You can hear there because the middle pickups wound out of phase, reverse polarity magnet, reverse polarity, or reverse wound. Uh, there's actually a degree of humbucking between those two pickups. The hum's a little quieter in the in-between position. So that's all in order. Now we'll just uh, nip up the tuning machine screws. They're almost always loose. Just be careful there that you don't strip the holes. You can, uh, you can fix it if you do. A little bit of dowel and some uh, super glue. Cyanoacrylate. Or wood glue if you've got time. Which I don't. We'll nip up the neck plate screws too. Yep, loose. Done up by a uh, 14 year old Chinese kid. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll whack some strings on there. I might, I'll stick another spring in that trim cavity and just back those screws off because they look almost maxed out. Now, being that they're learning, they're probably not super fussed about the tremolo at the moment. I'd say tuning stability is probably key, more so than trem functionality. So uh, I'm going to mount the trem hard against the body, and that way uh, if the tuning changes or they snap a string or anything, it'll still stay in tune. Um, and that's the most stable setup for, for tuning stability. One other thing I like to do before putting the strings on, depends how bad it is, but I'll remove the saddles completely just to clean the base of the bridge plate. Don't normally use a drill for this, but just like everything, be careful. Got the extension on there so it clears the body. Keep them in order on the bench. In this case, it's not critical because they're all identical, but some have different size slots. And uh, locate the string so each slot is uh, suited to that diameter string. So grab your uh, good old trusty wet rag again. Damp, I should say. Just get the excess crap on and uh, crap off and bring up the shine of the, the bridge plate. Now I've got a, where is it? Here it is. Little hog, hog bristle brush. Which instead of fully dismantling the thing, you can get into little crevices and just, it's soft enough to not scratch plastics. But it'll get in there and just get the crap out from next to the screw heads and stuff and really get in the corners. It's handy for little spots like there that the rag just won't go in. Sweet ass. So we'll chuck the saddles back on and put some strings on them. Right, so I've got the saddles back on but adjusted all the way out. So the screw's only just holding on. Then I like to get some just general light machine oil with a micro tip on it 
just put a tiny dab of oil right where the uh, the intonation screw enters just to prevent it from oxidizing from skin acids and stuff and then just a little bit on each saddle screw too these are notorious for seizing as they rust again from skin acids and stuff and then you gotta throw the saddles out and, and replace them which is just another cost you can avoid by a simple uh, little bit of oil there like I'm talking a speck of sand sized dab of oil and it works its way in there when you uh, wind those saddles back up so now I'll set the uh, the rough intonation so for a typical setup on a strat I start with the uh, the one E string about one mil back clearance between the, the bridge mount screw and the saddle and you go about half a mil to a mil step further on the next one and again on the next one I've gotten pretty good at getting this in the ballpark and only requires say a half or maybe a full turn to get it bang on uh, intoned with the tuner uh, so then so yeah half to a mil step, half to a mil step and then this one I set about the same as the B string and then start all over again so another say almost a mil to the next one there this is uh, assuming standard standard gauge strings and standard tuning however and then generally it's got that sort of shape to it shorter on the treble, longer on the bass and then there's a step where the wound strings start and it goes again you can sort of see at a glance if there's either something seriously wrong with the guitar or if it's just not set up by the saddles not having that general sort of pattern to them. If you've got a wound G, that step won't be between these two, it'll be between those two because it goes basically off the core, the size of the diameter of the core of the string, not the overall diameter. Right, so we've got it on its back again. We've popped the strings through, chucked another spring in the back there. I'm going to uh, wind it through the tuning machines and get it roughly up to tension. So, in preparation for uh, threading through the strings, we're going to align all the holes. So I like to have them about perpendicular, so the hole in the post is perpendicular to the neck. And one by one, shove them in. Leave a bit of slack on there. Make sure you haven't twisted them up. So you'll have to undo them again and untwist them before tuning up. Everyone has their own little methods of doing this. This is one I've found that works for me the best. <clears throat> so back to the bass string. About that much slack, so it just naturally forms a, you know, curve up to say, I don't know, there's no scientific <laughs> reasoning behind it, but it just feels right to me. Pull it back on itself, wrap it under, back over, and now the string locks and won't pull through the hole. Sort of like a clove hitch, I guess. Not quite, but you know, the string has tension on itself so it won't undo itself. Chop off the excess. Be careful not to chop the string while you're at it. <laughs> Done that a few times. Now, you don't want excessive wraps on it, say, one or two full wraps, depending on which string it is. Maybe two or three for the unwound strings. And that's about all you want. Any excess, or if it overlaps, you don't want the string to overlap itself as you're winding it on, so you sort of pull it down towards the, the face of the headstock, like that, as you do it. So it puts a nice even single layer wrap on it any overlapping can cause string breakage or just tuning instability you, you want it to be as tight as you can 
No way in between them. I hate it when people leave the excess strings floating around on the, uh, the end of the headstock. It was real popular and I think it was like a, a brick pop thing. <laughs> Take your eye out and sound terrible with any amount of distortion. A little bit of excessive length on that on the ninth hour string, but no biggie. That's what happens when you're uh, doing a video, eh? you get distracted. Just check all the saddles are all seated properly. Now, the next thing we want to do is a sort of process. Uh, if you start setting up one thing and then you go back to another, it changes that thing. So we try to set it up in an order that has the least um, the least interaction between each stage. So I'm plugging into the tuner. We'll get it ballpark tune or actual tune. I'll show you on that one so you can see it. When you're tuning, you want to come up to the pitch instead of going down, because there can be uneven tension between the nut and the, and the bridge and the nut and the uh, tuning machine. Let's check our bridge is still hard against the body. Yep, it is. Right, so the first thing we want to do is adjust the truss rod for optimum neck relief. Now it's a good idea to have a straight edge for this if you're doing it full time, but I'll just do it uh, as if you're doing it at home. Pretty accurate way of doing it still. You just hold the string past the last fret and then on the first fret, and the string acts like sort of like a straight edge and looking around the middle of that you can see the gap underneath the string and you're aiming for about 0.2 to 0.3 mil for a guitar a uh, six string and then about 0.5 for a bass to 0.75 depending on how heavy the player is or what tuning it is everything's different but this is sort of we're doing the standard setup on this now this had heavier strings on it before so it was excessively bowed but now we've put the 42s on there instead of the 4610s, the truss rod's taken over a bit. So now actually, believe it or not, that's about where we want it visually. So I think we're good to go. <laughs> that's very rarely the case. So the next thing we want to do is rough in the action of the outer two strings. So you need a suitable Allen key for this guitar which is a 1.5 millimeter, being an Asian guitar. <clears throat> if it's a US Fender, it'd be a 0.05 of an inch or 50 thou. So we're setting the um, height of the outer two strings first. So in the standard setup for standard tuning, we're aiming for uh, at the 12th fret, 0.75, uh, sorry, 1.75 of a mil under this one and 1.5 mil under this one. Um, you can go a little bit here or there after that, but that's the standard setup. If you want it to play even quicker, like faster action, you can uh, you can go down a little bit further, or if you're playing heavy or down tune, you can go up a little bit. <clears throat> but that's generally the starting point, particularly for guitars that don't have optimum frets, like more affordable guitars. So for that. We use, 
which I think I mentioned in another video, a string action ruler. That's one there. It's just a generic one. A lot of companies uh, have their own version. So this should be done in an upright position. I'm just showing you this to demonstrate with the video. So we hold the, the string action guide there. Just get your head down level with it. So adjust the saddle, keep it level, and get 1.75 mil. And go to the treble side. Go for your 1.5. Now normally, the outer saddles have shorter screws, so they don't poke up so much. This guitar does not. However, being a learner's guitar, they're probably not going crazy shred metal, palm muting, so it's not the end of the world. They're not very sharp feeling anyway. They're not too bad. These ones have got a little more <clears throat> little bevel on them. Uh, so yeah, we've adjusted the outer two strings to what we want. Now we want to jack the middle strings up a little bit beyond where they want to be and come down to that height. So for that we need the radius gauges, which again you can get online, various sources, because <clears throat> the shape of the strings has to make, match the shape of the fretboard. So in this case, We measure the fretboard first, which again we probably should have done before we put the strings on. <laughs> do you want to say, not what I do? Uh, I'm guessing this is 12 inch, just by looking at it. Maybe even flatter, it might be a 14. So just carefully part the strings there, fit the gauge under there. Yeah, winner winner, 14, mil, uh, 14 inch. So that's the actual radius if you were to extend the curve of those frets into a circle. The, uh, the circle would be 28 inches across or 14 inch radius. So then we grab that same gauge, carefully slip it under there and don't scratch the plastic in the process. Now, because we've lifted the center strings, I'll just zoom in there. So we hold the, uh, we hold the radius gauge on the outer two strings, so it's touching them, but not excessively pulling up either because that'll give us false readings. We hold it as close as we can to the saddles, gently pull it upwards, and because the middle strings we lifted to clear the gauge so it wasn't rocking on them, now we slowly bring them down until they just touch. Try to keep the saddles level in the process, but you can go through and fine tune that afterwards. It's kind of hard to visually do it all at once. Look from the end where you're holding the gauge and adjusting everything. Just get it in the ballpark and then fine tune it after with it. That's the, uh, the way I found it the easiest anyway. I'll do some better setup videos in the future. I'm just, just warming up to it at the moment. Learning to do educational videos is just like anything else is a learning curve. But this is mainly just to show you why Setups cost what they cost because they are time consuming. You can do them quick and dirty, or you can do them properly. Some people are quicker than me, no doubt. So, we've got them in the rough shape of the fretboard. We just want to tune it back up again. Everything's gone out because we've played with the string tension and string height. Double check that now. The strings uh, lose their straight shape when they uh, aren't under the normal tension. So yeah, a few need to be dropped again, primarily the thick unwound one. 
Right, now what we'll do is just check that all the saddles are more or less level. Now if they're not, say that one needs a quarter turn to go down, we'll halve that to go, say, a eighth of a turn, then go an eighth of a turn up on the other one. And the string ends up at about the same height, but the uh, saddle's now level. Now don't get too caught up between looking at the bottom edge of the saddles because they're pressed metal, the cheapest way possible. They're not consistent, so each saddle's a little bit different to the previous one by just how it sat in the jig when it got pressed. We'll just double check everything's still good there and yeah, no, that's good. So now we should be pretty well matching the shape of the fretboard for the shape of the strings. Now this ne next aspect of a setup is the part where most people get confused if they haven't done it before. It's the intonation. So we've set the action truss rod, now we're setting the intonation. Um, that is essentially how long the string is. Now we want the 12th fret to be in the middle of the string, not necessarily physically, but pitch wise. So when you have a string above a fret, naturally when you fret it down, you introduce some tension into the string and it goes up in pitch. So intonation is to comp compensate for that basically. And as the string is thicker, that effect is higher. So the saddle needs to be brought back further. So essentially it lowers the pitch of the 12th fret in relation to the open string, but that compensates for the introduced tension, so you end up with exactly an octave, which is what we want. So we'll start now, we've got our rough shape of them, which we totally guessed. So we'll just tune the string open. Again, this should be done upright in playing position, but I'm just doing it horizontally for the purposes of the video and the viewing public, which is you. So we'll do a harmonic at the 12th, just hold your finger gently on the 12th. You can see they were more or less in tune. And the wheel stops spinning, that means we're in tune. Then we'll fret it. And we're about right. <laughs> Again, it only works when you're doing a video. That one's a little bit off, but pretty damn close. Just tune that up a little so it stops moving. Do the harmonic. Fretter. She's good. You watch, they're all going to be perfect, so I can't demonstrate it. I'll have to throw one string way off just to just to show you. Right, that one's a little bit sharp when we're fretting it. See they're moving there, but not when I do the harmonic. So I'm doing harmonic there, fretting there. On the B string, bring that up in pitch a bit. <coughs> harmonic, fretted. It's a bit flat. Harmonic, fretted, that's a bit flat too. So let's throw it way out, just to demonstrate. We'll do it on a high E. So say we just threw the saddles in there randomly or they just came in randomly, tune it up. Harmonic, fretted, see how much flatter it is? That means essentially when you fret it, the gap between the saddle and the 12th fret isn't half pitch wise, the gap between the saddle and the nut. So what we have to do to compensate for that is bring the saddle back out to shorten the length of the string between the 12th and the saddle in comparison to the length between the nut and the saddle. Now naturally that'll go out of tune. So we'll bring it back up. Harmonic. Fret it. Still a little bit flat. We'll go a little bit further. Tune her up again. So 
sometimes to help with the stabilizing the tuning uh, tuner turn your tone down and put it on the bridge pickup or maybe the most humbucky position the harmonics in the string confuse it you essentially want a pure fundamental and the easiest way to get that is turn your tone all the way down you can see that's jumping around a lot less now I'm going to go just a little bit further. I think we're there. So again, that's the harmonic. And then fret it. And they're the same. So then I'll generally, the save time, will go on to the G string. That's good. And then I'll find the halfway point between the two and put the B string there. Hard to see on video what the tune is doing, but bring the G up again. A bit too far. Let's give all the strings a stretch. It's a good idea after you string it up. Once or twice, bring it up the pitch again, do it again. Alright, so back to G string. Double check that. A little bit twitchy, but this is a super accurate tuner, so. One of the A. The wound strings are pretty well bang on, just, just straight off the bat. We're in the ballpark. Do some fine tuning with the guitar in an upright playing position. But essentially, that's the principle of it. Hello. Right, so here we're going to adjust the pickup height. So I like to go start from about, say, about 3 mil, 4 mil for each pickup when you fret it up around, say, the 14th fret. These pickups are ceramic and have a bit of a weaker magnetic field, so they don't pull on the string as much, but when you're doing your intonation settings, I should have mentioned this earlier, you, uh, you generally want to wind your pickups down as low as you can go, because the pulling of the magnets on the strings can affect the pitch and the tone of the, the string as well as the sustain. So sometimes weaker, ba uh, weaker magnets are better. Um, there's also level balance comes into play. If you've got one pickup that's particularly uh, higher output than the others, you can whack that down lower and get a sort of uh, more balanced output as you switch between them. But this whole video is written on pickup height, so this is just a cursory glance just to let you know that it's something you should check if it's dramatically out. Um, Want to have a look at giving him an adjustment. You can see these pole pieces are staggered down here. That's to match the curve of the fretboard and the curve of the strings so you have more consistent output per string compared compared to the neighboring string you see on some uh, higher end pickups that there's actually a step in the staggering because again the core is what the, the core of the wire the core of the uh, string is what the pickups actually picking up so your um, your D string the core is actually thinner than your G string 
even though the G strings the outer diameter is smaller because it's not wound it gives higher output so the staggering has a step in some other brands where it'll compensate for that too and that's more even so the next thing we're going to check out is if it's dramatically out you probably should do this early on but if you do it without things adjusted properly you might take the slots too deep the nut slot height once you take the slots too deep you can either repair the nut again by filling that slot with something either super glue or or whatever um, or you just have to replace the nut which sucks a bit so the issue is if you have the string too high when you fret it it'll go out of pitch because there's too much tension introduced on the string plus it's just hard to play uh, if you have it too low it starts buzzing on the first fret and it sounds real crappy and affects your sustain uh, when the strings open so it's finding that sweet spot and this is uh, probably the for beginners the most nerve-wracking part <laughs> so um, got the string height gauge it's kind of hard to show because it goes the other way it's designed for you to look at from this side uh, so we're aiming for about 0.25 of a mil under the string when you sit them on the frets so they're all sitting around that one's about 0.5 so I'll start from the E string so that's about 0.5 it's about 0.4 that's over 0.5 that's almost 0.75 that's 0.5 and that's 0.5 of a millimetre. So that's pretty inconsistent. Um, what we want to do is have them all even and uh, it'll make it easier to play and it'll stay in, in pitch. So when you're starting out, you you really, it's probably the worst time that you want to be second guessing your instrument because you don't know any better. So you just assume that it's your fault and why don't I sound like that record? Well, you're never going to if the basics aren't set up. So, for this, so the last one only needs a touch. For this, I've got uh, gauged nut files. You can see the measurement there. It's actually a really, this one in, in particular for the one E string is really skinny and the, uh, they're like little saw blades but very fine. And you want to uh, get in there and just don't go too far, just do a little bit and check it. sit it in there just check that it comes out easily too if it gets stuck in there that's just as bad you want it to um, gently come back out without sticking because that can introduce tuning stability issues as well all right we're sitting at 0.25 so that's good on to the next onto the B string so we'll grab the next file which is a 0.013 that's it there, it says it on the handle. Oop, then I drop it on the floor. <laughs> this is just a plastic nut. Uh, the cheap air guitars will either have just plastic like a nylon, like this one is. The real cheap ones will be PVC, which the string usually embeds itself into and you have to replace it. <laughs> then as you work your way up the cost, uh, they start putting glass fiber in the plastic and that wears your files out very quick, but it is very tough. And then uh, you get move up to bone or, or graph tech, graph, graphite with glass fiber as well, I believe. And this tusk, which is essentially like a, uh, same stuff they make the Corian bench tops out of. Two five, that's good. One of the seventeen. It's a sixteen gauge string, but <clears throat> seventeen is close enough. Be careful not to scratch the face of the headstock while you're doing this. If you're not paying attention. <sighs> All right, so see that that one's sticking in the slot. Comes out with a little click that's no good we want to widen it up a bit so you just run the file over at a bit of an angle wiggle it back and forth 
not too much. If your slot's too wide, then it can buzz in the slot. Still a little bit sticky, but better. We'll just go again. All right, that's better. It's coming out easily when I pull it out. What height are we at? 0.25, good stuff. On the 24, <laughs> that way, not 42, meaning alive. Just take little bites, it's easier to, you can always take more off. It's the pain in the ass to put more back on. Sorry, we should be using the 32 for that. I was still in acoustic mode. <laughs> Just did an acoustic five seconds ago. Now, the most important thing with this kind of work is just make sure your tongue's poking out. Otherwise, you'll screw it up royally. Five. The thirty-six. So if they don't match the um, the string gauge exactly. You just have to get the next next one up or next one down and just do the wiggle wiggle. So we've got a 42 gauge string. Let's check the height of that. 0.25, bang on. So, we're pretty well there. Right, so I've uh, checked everything in the upright plane position and everything's given, uh, been given a little bit of a tweak to suit that. Uh, nothing's really moved, the neck's really nice and low, no massively high frets, no weird buzzers. <laughs> spots that you generally find them which is down in this area or in this area if the next two bowed a hair of one there but you got to remember that it's not the it's not a five thousand dollar fretboard no dead notes bend without the strings choking out and more importantly it's really easy to play with the 42 gauge strings on there and really low action so I think they're going to be very happy with that so I'll replace this uh, switch tip with just pointing the parts drawer and pop the back cover back on the tremolo and she's good to go. Now this wasn't an instruction on how to set up your guitar. I'll probably do one of them later on in a little bit more detail, a bit more planned. Maybe some diagrams and stuff if I'm feeling saucy. But um, this is just basically what's involved in a setup, why it costs what it does and why it's important to do. So I hope you go get your guitars and get them set up so you play better.
That way you can't blame the guitar. It's your fault for not practicing enough. So there you have it, champions. Thanks for watching. And, uh, you know, subscribe, share it around and like it and stuff, you know, or don't. I don't really care because I'm about to puke. Yeah.